All right. Good morning and welcome, everyone. Um, excited to be here with you all for the final day of uh, NCAT's third annual conference, uh, Growing Hope, Practical Tools for Our Changing Climate. Uh, my name is Mike Lewis, and I'm a sustainable agriculture specialist with the National Center for Appropriate Technology. And today we are going to be talking with producers who are building and cultivating community uh, in hopes of uh, cultivating some curiosity and sparking conversations that will empower uh, each of us through shared learning to support and uh, lift each other up through difficult times and to celebrate some of the progress that we've seen along the way. Um, before we do get started, because I'm a, a little sappy, I'm going to throw out a quick quote here from one of my favorite authors, Mr. Wendell Berry, from his book, The Art of the Commonplace, as I think it relates to this. Um, a community is the mental and spiritual condition of knowing what the place is shared and that the people who share the place define and limit the responsibilities of each other's lives. It is the knowledge that people have of each other, their concern for each other, their trust in each other, and the freedom with which they come and go amongst themselves. And I know um, I'm, I'm excited to share that and I'm excited to be involved in this community piece of this. Um, but before we dive in, uh, we do want to acknowledge our sponsors, our conference sponsors. This year's Growing Hope Conference is free for all participants, and that has been made possible uh, through the generous support of NCAT, uh, ATRA, Sustainable Agriculture Project, uh, USDA Rural Development, the Rural South Institute, Western SARE, the Hemp Industries Association, and Clearwater Credit Union. So thank you very much for our sponsors. We're going to pause here. I'm going to pause here for just a second while we watch a quick video. Now, this conference is supported in part by Western SARE, um, the Western Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education uh, SARE works to advance innovations that improve profitability, stewardship, and the quality of life in American agriculture by investing in groundbreaking research and education. Um, SARE's grant programs include the involvement of farmers and ranchers from inception to finish, uh, and currently, SARE's uh, Farmer Rancher Grant Program is accepting proposals. Um, I do want to also point out that Western SARE provides a diverse collection of educational resources uh, like books, fact sheets, bulletins, curricula, multimedia presentations, and, and a lot more content as well. So we'd hope that you would visit their website at westernsare.org to learn more about their programming and the important work that they're doing to support rural communities around the country. Um, so today, I'm pleased to introduce our first panelist, uh, Taya O'Carroll. Uh, Taya manages her family farm in Northeast Nebraska, growing uh, organic wheat, continuing to transition more of their acres into organic production. Taya is committed to building soil health and restoring ecological function on the land she manages. Um, her lessons learned through her organic transition actually led uh, Taya to design a white glove consulting service that brings people in agriculture together through tailored solutions around domestic production 
and also assists food and feed brands to develop custom supply chain solutions. By building community, Taya endeavors to catalyze necessary change to help to uh, protect the land and the farmers who, stu who steward that land. Uh, Taya, thank you so much for your time and welcome to Growing Hope. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mike. And uh, thank you to our host and all of our sponsors. It's a real um, pleasure to be here. And thank you for allowing me to share um, our experiences, um, what's happening on our farm. Uh, resiliency is huge. And it's, it's just something that I think you kicked us off with, Mike. It's uh, about community and how we all participate together and how everything comes together. And one of the things I, I'm often asked is, well, why do you do what you do? Um, how are you making changes on your farm? How are you getting through the day? And how are you adapting to change? And there's no doubt, there's no doubt anybody on this um, meeting or somebody who listens to it will ever think that things aren't changing. It's just, and I think they always have. It's just more of a matter of how fast they're changing. I think it feels like the world has sped up. I don't know about you, but it feels like Christmas was yesterday. So <laughs> uh, one of the things that um, people always ask, like I said, is how do we do it? Why do we do it? And one of the things that I'd like to share today is not just that, you know, we're farmers, we're also a community in how we come together. And there's four key things that I would like to share today that it's something to think about. You know, I'm an action-oriented person, so I always like to think of, okay, well, what can I do with this information? So four things that I would like to share today are to help us with resiliency and adapting to change our mindset, our community, profitability, and the next generation. And you know, when we work with nature, when we're outside, um, whether you're working with livestock, you're working with soil, I think one of the beautiful things about being in nature, even if you're out for a hike, is it has a feeling to it. It has a beat. It has its own rhythm. And what we actually bring to the table every day completely affects everything. And what most of us might not think about when we bring to the table, we're thinking implements, seeds, you know, weather, all the different inputs, things like that. But sometimes we tend to overlook our mindset. And our mindset is everything and everything that we do in our operation literally is impacted and starts with our mindset. And I know that at times there's so many things, especially, you know, lately is that there's so many things that feel out of our control, the weather, um, the news, world events, politics, neighbors, political, this, that, the other, whatever's happening in our own home. There's all these things that are constantly going on. Um, and that's, going to happen. It's, it is what it is. But I, what we have found for ourselves is when we focus on our own backyard, what is in my control? What can I do? It actually has us, uh, gives us a way to get our game on. Um, I don't know if anybody out there is a sports enthusiast or played or has, you know, watched a lot of games and you'll hear somebody, you'll sometimes hear that coach or you hear yourself and you'll say, get your head in the game. And well, that's not any different with agriculture. Um, it all starts with getting your head in the game because we're the ones that drive that operation. We're the ones that are going to move it forward. And if we have that solid foundation of a direction in like that solid um, stable mindset of not being so swayed by everything that's going around us, it allows us to get out of that paralysis mode and actually move forward. So, you know, there's so many things that we hear on the TV. One of the ways that we do it is you have to ask yourself the question of how is this serving me? Is the is it information? Is it, you know, you know, it, or is it, am I just sitting there watching something continually going by? It's like you, you kind of get stuck glued to watching the TV and all this stuff happening. Whereas you have to come to the point of, yep, got my information, I know what I'm going to do, and move forward. There's always a reason to be informed. But back to the beginning is starting with your mindset. Make sure you're clear, you know what you got in the game, and when you have that strong mental fortitude, anything can move forward. Um, I think it's the basis for everything. Um, so the other thing that I would like to focus on is the power of the community. 
a lot of times, depending on where you live or how you farm, it can feel isolated. I mean, we're in rural environments a lot of the time uh, for a reason. And one of the benefits, I think, of farming is people always say, well, why do you farm organic? Why do you farm regenerative? You know, why do you do what you do? And that's the gift of being able to be your own operator. You can choose on how you want to farm. But with the regenerative and especially regenerative organic, it's a different kind of set of mindset. Um, so something I'd like to have you just try on today, if you're not headed that way, is just just think about instead of, you know, the attitude of competing with your neighbors on agriculture and, you know, what was your yield, what's my yield, what turns different with regenerative and organic specifically is you start competing more with yourself your neighbors or your friends or people that you meet within the industry um, become your allies. People want to share. They want to help. So I encourage you to reach out. Uh, find those like-minded people. There's people on the Internet. There's so many people who have done incredible things. Um, there's conferences, uh, your seed dealers, you know, cover crop dealers, wherever the people that you interact with and you're finding um, input. They all have a network. Um, get involved. Uh, third thing I'd like to share or think about is profitability. How are we going to stay out there? So one of the number thing, one things that we have to do is protect our assets. And we steward over that every day. And like I said, with those people on the Internet or different people that you hear at conferences, they're inspirational. But if you really listen to the tone of what they're doing, a lot of times that inspiration came through survival. So how are they going to stay out there? What are they going to do? I'm just encouraging you, get ahead of that game and, you know, find different ways that you can make money. And you're probably like, hello, I'm working on that every day, you know. <laughs> what do you think I'm out here doing? And, um, you know, I'm constantly twisting and seeing, you know, tweaking and seeing what I can do to actually see what I can do to increase that profitability. But we've kind of come to a point of, you know, there's not a lot of margin in agriculture. Um, so the way that we've actually started to become more profitable, that has been um, creating more resiliency to climate, to environment, to my own mindset, if you will, is we've actually started finding ways that we can save money, not necessarily ways that we can make money. So saving money for us is, it's different for everybody's operation, but like organic and especially regenerative, I'm looking at, I'm, I do row crops. Um, like Mike said in the beginning, we do wheat, corn, soybeans, alfalfa, different things like that. So I'm thinking in scales of how do I take less passes through the field? You know, how can I create less agitation to that soil to help keep it, you know, healthy, keep it sealed, keep those microbes uh, fed? You know, what can I do in that way? How can I put uh, cover crops together so I'm actually not buying inputs? You know, so th those are things that we're constantly, we can't, it is a work in progress. And if that sounds overwhelming or daunting to different people is like, are you kidding me? No inputs? How am I going to do this? I've relied upon this stuff for so long. It's step by step. We just start with a few acres here. We start with a few acres there. There's, there's so many factors that determine whether that's going to work or not, but you have to try. All I can say is you have to try. And once you're able to start cutting back in different inputs, I mean, your profitability, your resilience, you're, you're no longer dependent upon a system to keep you in business. You become your own business. And that's something that I can't emphasize enough is your autonomy and building your community. Because to do that, you're going to think you're crazy. Um, you're going to think like, why would I go out and do these different things? And that's back to the power of community. When you find your network, you find those people who are doing things, you get to brainstorm. You get to share that enthusiasm. Oh, that didn't work, you know, or wow, that was really cool. I'm going to try that again. Or, oh, you tweaked it like this. I didn't even know you could do that to your equipment. Um, so I can't express that enough. And one of my favorite things that I'm passionate about is um, the fourth thing that we've found for resiliency in our community 
is the next generation. They are so inspiring. It's um, amazing. So depending on where you went to school, if you've heard that old adage or sometimes from a movie, they say, look to your left, look to your right, and that person isn't going to be around anymore. I don't want that in my neighborhood. Um, we grow up on uh, sections, like in the Midwest, we're chunked into sections. So growing up, there used to be four families on a section, and that was normal. We were populated. We were there. But as times have gone on, I've watched things go. I've watched things change. We have to be able to share opportunities with that next generation to remember how we got started. You know, be inspired by those people who just, even if it's passing a few words or shared some sense of inspiration with you, how did you get started? What, what made you excited to be able to share something with somebody else? and share those opportunities. We, yeah, we have to be out here. We have to be profitable, but one of the things I think we also have to do is to be able to share. And so we found for us, one of the ways we've been able to give back to community is we're, we're dividing up different pieces of our ground to be able to rent to young new farmers. And they're not necessarily new. They grew up in the farming community. So they are very adept at what they do. They bring new ideas. They um, are forward thinking. They're open mindset. Um, and it allows them to get a start. It allows them to do different things where they might not have the opportunity because access to land, access to equipment, access to capital are huge. It's real and um, always has been. And how do we get past that is back to that community aspect. How do we help somebody else out? It's our turn. And those are things that I just thank you for allowing me to share them with you today. It was something that, like I said, we're very passionate about in its different ways that through the mindset, power of community, profitability, and the next generation, and um, that we've been able to sustain our farm. And um, hopefully that helps somebody else. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for sharing that, Taya. One of the one of the things that stuck out to, to me. Uh, when you were when you were talking was the this uh, concept of adaptability right and it, it seems like that's something you've mastered but I do uh, before we move on to the, the next panelist I do want to ask a, just a one or two follow-up questions um, and okay. obviously one of the one of the big things on my mind I, I started farming thinking about my kids and and the next generation and you and you you made that a strong fourth point for that about the next generation. But I'm, I'm wondering if uh, briefly you could share um, just from your experience, what is it that the next generation that we can do as this generation to help prop up the next generation that's going to be taking the the reins over from us? Because, you know, I, I keep getting older and I keep wondering who's, who's next, who's taking this torch on. So is there some specific lessons you have about what we could be doing to support the future generations in this work. Uh, thank you. And um, I, I laugh a little bit when you say I've mastered adaptability because I would say no way. <laughs> I would say it's it's an iter iterative process of adapt, change, adapt, change, adapt, change. And, you know, it's just it's constantly a growing process. Um, in Next Generation, we're a little bit different. Um, I don't have children, so I wasn't blessed with that. And um, so I really have to think about what's next? How, how are we going to do this? How can we help somebody else? Um, so things that we have done on our farm that's worked for us is um, we pooled equipment. So, I mean, these equipment costs are unbelievable. You have to have the tools to go do the job. You can have all the can-do attitude you want, but if you don't have the tools, you can't get there. So what we did is we pooled equipment um, through different farmers working together and their fathers and their uncles are supporting them. So they've got that backing. Um, financially, um, we've divided it up. So it's not just one person that's coming in and helping us. We've got multiple people coming in and helping us. And that again, builds that resiliency because we put that community together of these farmers that can 
talk to each other and they're not out there alone going, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Or the world gets heavy. You're sitting in the tractor and it's like, what am I going to do? You know, it's not raining. I mean, how am I going to pay for this? We try to divide up that risk through a risk mitigation standpoint. So we also divide up the crops that we have. So we're not just you know, it looks more back to old school, if you will, a patchwork quilt of opportunities for a field versus just monoculture straight one field. So financially, that put us at less risk as well. And uh, the lending aspect is a real challenge as well. So they have young farmer programs through the USDA that has helped them at lower interest rates. And again, by working, I know I sound repetitive, but working again through that community of people coming together, they have been able to, everybody takes a piece of the risk, everybody takes a piece of the prize, and we together have lowered the rental rate if they're renting the ground or if we are sharecropping with them. We mix that model to be able to have less cash outflow in the beginning, more return at the end, and yet it balances an income throughout the year for them. So I hope that helps. No, that that was wonderful. Thank you so much. And if if you do, we're, we'll have a short Q and A after the rest of yep. the panelists. So if if anybody has any more questions for Taya, please just drop them in the chat, and they'll they'll get they'll get uh, heard. So um, thank you so much for sharing, uh, Taya. Our our next panelist is uh, Kimberly Ratcliffe. Um, and we're excited to have Kimberly with us. Uh, in, in addition to managing her family's ranch in East Texas, uh, Caney Creek Ranch, Kimberly also launched a farm to freezer meat company to purchase finished cattle from Caney Creek Ranch with the mission uh, to provide the highest quality ranch direct beef possible in a simple, convenient, and responsible manner. Um, Kimberly is also the president of the 100 Ranchers, a community-based uh, organization that she founded in 2008. Uh, 100 Ranchers serves agricultural producers dedicated to working together uh, in community to increase their bottom line and improve their livelihood by producing safe, clean, efficient, and marketable products. Uh, Kimberly sits on many statewide and national boards and committees and is frequently asked to speak at conferences. So we are so excited that you could make the time to be with us today, Kimberly, and welcome to Growing Hope. Thank you. Thank you. And it's an honor. And thank you guys for inviting me. And thank you to everyone that's participating today. Um, this is one of my topics I love to speak on because um, this is the base of what my livelihood has been on. I have honestly say if it wasn't for the community, I would not probably be in front of you guys today. Um, I like to start and, I, and I'm really going to and I love that previous speakers started with four key points. And I'm going to start with four key points before I even start with my story. Many of you on here have probably heard my story. I'm going to talk about my four key points because it's it's part of my story. So I need to tell you the four key points and then I'm going to go to my story. So I'm really going to talk about how I build a community here where I am living, which is the highest population of Black producers in the United States. And when I realized that, I realized there has to be a formation of a community to support these this demographic that really needed assistance. So to do that, we had a vision, we had a planning, we had an impl implementation, and we had evaluation. So let's start with the vision. The vision actually started with me coming back home. So many of you might heard my story before. I went from Wall Street to the ranch. So I went. I was working for a financial information firm. Um, and while working there, I um, had the honor of working on a lot of different platforms there. And one of them was the commodity platform. And when I was working on that commodity platform, I actually um, had the opportunity to, the, when I was working on the commodity platform, my parents actually expanded their ranching operation. And um, I was in New York City by myself parents weren't there living in there by myself so every morning I would call my dad and my dad would just tell me what was going on at the ranch all the good and the bad things that were going coming on at the ranch I'm sorry my phone keeps ringing I have to hang it up um all the good things and bad things that happened on the ranch and I finally reached a point 
saying, okay, what side do I want to play on? Do I want to play on this financial side who are actually taking a product that we are hardworking and it needs to be there, but it's just, it's just what side that I want a hard product that we are raising, or do I want to raise this product to the full capacity and teach my community about the, the, the ways of how our product is actually sold and bought. So I decided I'd leave my Wall Street firm company and come back home. And when I came back home, the community would come to me and be like, Kim, how can I get my kids to do the same exact thing? I said, they have to have the passion. If they don't have the passion to come back home, then it's just not gonna happen. And so a group of the producers said, we've had this big idea of really learning from each other. Can you take this idea and expand it to our community? So their idea was to come in and say, how can we learn from each other? We're all getting older, et cetera. I said, of course, I'll take it. And we formed the 100 Ranchers. So that was our vision. Our vision was how can we take a community and learn from each other? And it really started with those key formational people in the community that were just lost. They were like, I've been working all my life. I'm, I'm coming back to the ranch or I just bought an operation and you just went to school and I should back up a little bit. I went from Wall Street to TCU Ranch Management Program. So I didn't just go from Wall Street to home. I got some knowledge because I knew that I needed that knowledge to come back to the ranch. And after I got done with TCU Ranch Management, they were like, okay, you just learned all this ranch management stuff teach us. And the one thing any education probably tells you, you don't remember everything you had in school. You remember for the time you take that test, right? You don't necessarily remember for the time length of everything else, but you have the resources. You have that book, you have that network, and that's what I wanted to bring to the community. I didn't want to bring the knowledge because I have the knowledge, but I think it's good to have those resources that you can bring back to community and build that community back up. So the vision was to take this community and learn from each other and go to each other's operation and build that community by inviting people when we have an event in that community to that person's operation and learn whatever they wanted to learn on that operation and bring whatever resources are possible to that operation for that workshop. So it was if they wanted to do fencing, okay, we're gonna bring someone in on how to do correct fencing. If they want to learn about animal health and it was producer driven, it wasn't what we wanted to do as, a, as an organization. So that's the key thing I always tell us when you go into that planning stage, so you have your vision and then you're going to that planning stage, we have to make sure it's producer driven. And then when it's producer driven, they become on board and then they wanna expand and they wanna, they wanna be bigger. So it's, I always call it, 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 it sounds harsh, but it has to be citizen controlled. It can't be, Organization, organizational control. It has to be citizen control to, in order for us to expand and bring those youth involved and bring the whole community involved, has to be citizen control. You do have a dedicated person that's empowered to control that, which was with me, but you still have those citizens coming to you and saying, these are the resources I need. These are the barriers that I have. Can we have some kind of planning or can we have some kind of implementation? So we have, the fortunate thing is we have pockets of minority producers that are pretty much in four different pockets. So we concentrate on those pockets. One is near me, I'm there in, in Northeast Texas. One is in the San Antonio area. There's, there's Gonzalo, there's that area over there. One's in the Liberty area, Beaumont area, which is really, really key. And one's in the Tyler, which is still East Texas, but it's a little further, that Tyler area. And that's really our key pockets that we want because we have to have some key areas. We have to have a territorial because if I did all 254 in Texas, I would be lost. So I had to concentrate on four different pockets when it came to my planning and work with those four different pockets from there. And then implementation. What do we do? How do we get participation? And it really was word of mouth because believe it or not, we all know each other in our community. We know each other, but when you say we're going to have a bonfire, we're going to have good music, barbecue, but we're also going to learn, they're going to show up. We realized we have to put a little fun in there with a little education. They showed up and we made it more of a community building workshop, not a workshop that you're sitting there and have to take notes. And, and I'm not saying notes aren't good, but if you're trying to build something, I feel like it's hard to build when you're sitting in the classroom 
and you're just looking at a projector. You got to build in the field. You can't build necessarily with our community in the classroom because they're not going to go to the classroom. It can be a in the field classroom, but it's it's difficult to do it in a in a classroom setting. So our implementation, we actually tweaked it as we go. And I'll be honest, guys, I learned these steps as I was going through. I was like, oh, now I got a plan. Now I have to implement. So it's okay to kind of learn as you go because it really was a learning process for me. And um, implication was really good. We kind of, um, like I said, we started learning from each other and going to each other's operation and realizing regionally that everyone has their own issues when it comes to regionally. I get more rain than some of the other people get rain. So it's just learning that process and learning maybe how we kind of work on our barriers within our environment and using um, alternative. The other thing I did with implementation, I really am concentrating on being diverse on our operation. And that's one thing that I am trying my hardest with my community is because they are relying on one source of income. How can we expand? And I'm gonna turn my camera off. It does this every once in a while, guys, I'm sorry. How can we expand to keep this community together with our implementation of having a diverse community, not just diverse in what we look like, but diverse in how we have our operations. So with that, we got sponsorships with our, to implement that. We've, ha we've sponsored with a lot of universities across the um, United States and, and, and Texas. We have a lot of corporate when it comes to our financial side, because I always turn I have a financial side in there. We have um, corporate as in our animal health. So every workshop that I'm doing, there's some kind of sponsorship attached to that. So it's key, just like this workshop, it's hard to put together if we don't have a sponsorship, but the sponsorship is related to whatever that workshop is in that implementation. And also with that, that has provided us an opportunity to go beyond our sponsorship. So right now, um, we started with best practices but once we went back to after our, our workshops, we back, went back to our evaluation, we realized we need to expand beyond best practices. We need to expand on how we're going to take the market to the next level. How are we going to take those best practices and take that what animal or that livestock to the next stage and have a marketable product? So that's when we actually are now sponsor, um, partnering with Cargill. So um, I've been working with Cargill for the last two years on something called the Black Farmer Equity Initiative. It's been a great, great uh, um, partnership between us. Um, I know a lot of people feel all different ways between having a big company working with them, but you have to realize, I'm realizing that they're not going anywhere, guys only way you're going to do is partner with them and tell them about your community and your barriers and et cetera, and figuring out how they can help your community um, because they're not going anywhere. And that was the realization that I told the board is we might as well work with them and let them know about a community and help them fund things that will help our community out. So with that being said, we did about 15, I did about 15 different listening sessions with their um with their customers. And those listening sessions was talking about our black, our black community and where we started. It started way back on when we got our name to I'm being honest with Acres and a Mule all the way up to now. You, uh, you have to know the whole story to understand our community. And if you didn't know it, you know it in this listening section. And from there, how some of those barriers, how, how, how those affected us to today and how, why our barriers are existing because of our past history. So we had those listening sessions with um, their customers and one of their customers, which is Gordon Foods. Um, and I just realized Gordon Foods this week opened six stores in Texas. So they are expanding. Um, Gordon Foods um, came to Cargill and said, how can I help market the meat, the, the livestock for 100 ranchers? So with that, we, decided that we were gonna do a branded meat product. So I am working diligently. If anyone has started something from scratch, it is starting all over again. The vision, the planning, the implementation and the evaluation. So I'm starting all over again with this project. It's been a little difficult 
just because of the, the drought last year. We were supposed to start last year, but the drought last year, the producers really didn't want to keep those cattle. They really want to sell them straight off the calf. And there's some um, prerequisites that they have to have in order to participate in this program. So we really couldn't start last year. Um, but the goal of it is for us to be a percentage of Gordon Foods product. There's probably, it's probably going to take us years to be the whole, be a whole branded beef product, but you could have a percentage and tell our story with the percentage of a product. It might be 2%, it might be 3%. We're not quite sure where that percentage will be, but it will be some percentage. So what it's, what this program is hopefully going to accomplish is we are taking the middlemen out. We are going directly to the end person, which is allowing for that profitability to get back into our, into our community. So we have our best practices we're already doing and hopefully the marketing side. So the producers will only have to raise them to the calf size. They have to 90 day weed them and do all the normal vaccinations that are normal. And then from there, we're working with a Fiona feed yard in West Texas to take that product and take it all the way to the end. Right now, we're, we understand there's not a consistency of all the cattle. They're gonna be all over the place just because everyone has Brahmin to Hereford to Charlay in their herd. So right now we're just working on just having a added ground meat product because you can take a ground meat product until we get that consistency and get a, um, a, a bear market type of cattle. And then from there, we can start with our bear market type of cattle and go from there. Um, so um, I've been really planning this right now. Like I said, those four regionals that we had, which was good. We already had four regional locations that we were working with our producers were. Now we have four regional grow yards that our producers can now bring those cattle to that um, central location. And from there, we can sell um, the cattle to directly to Fiona Feed Yard. I am not, because of our community, I am not trying to work on anti-antibiotic. I am not trying to work on anything else. Get the, the bare minimum in there. From there, we can work on other kind of added value stuff. But I think if I throw too much into our community, I lose a lot of producers. So you have to work with where they're at. And that's the one thing I'm, I'm, I need, I, I really try to say in the vision, when I went to the vision, I said, we cannot put these stipulations and say they need to be grass fed, they need to be organic, they need to be all this. We need to say you need to be a good producer. From there, we can work on some other little added value um, products with that producer. But if we add all these stipulations, we lose a lot of producers. So that was the vision. So again, our vision originally was just to learn best practices is all the way now gone to a marketing organization. Our planning, we originally started with planning, just going to each other location. Now we're planning now, we do workshops at our, look. we're doing workshops now at those um, grow yards. We're doing workshops now with Cargill. So our planning has really expanded to meet that marketing stop. And then our implementation is <laughs> how are we getting these cattle now to be on a feed yard so we can have a meat product. How are we implementing this marketing strategy to have a meat product? And then we are constantly evaluation. I feel like evaluation is something at each stage. It really shouldn't be at the end. You should be like, oh, vision. Okay, let's evaluate our vision. Make sure we are keeping it at our planning stage. Let's evaluation. So I really don't like evaluation to be at the end. I feel like evaluation should be at every single point of creating that community. Um, and I, we sold really, really and truly, even though it was a drought, our goal is to sell not a lot. It's just 2,500 this year. Um, I'm still having it hard with that because people are like the market's so good. I don't want to keep them for additional 90 days. So this is the stuff I'm working on when you're trying to build an actual brand. You have producers that realize the market's high. So what am I doing? I'm actually working with cattle facts now to do some, um, marketing analysis for them to let them understand that. If they were to keep their cattle, the price of their calves would go this much up. So it's really educating them about the whole system. It's not at just educating them about, okay, the cattle prices are here. Yes, the cattle prices are here, but if you 90 day wean them and we end up selling them to Fiona, you realize how much more profitability you're gonna get. Cause they're looking at $2 and be like, that's great. 
but you might be able to get more profit if you actually keep them for 90 days. So that whole education system of the market and the other education part that I'm really trying to bring into them is really understanding how that price is created. And I know this is deep stuff, but I think this is stuff we really need to start educating our producers of, how that price is created. I am so proud to have a meat company that I raise 100% of my meat here in Texas. But we also have to realize that a lot of percentage of our meat does go overseas. And the reason why it goes overseas is because we don't eat tongue, because we don't eat a lot of those products. And if we don't eat those products, they need to go overseas because about 20 to 30% of those products go into our bottom line of our price. I'm all about made in the USA. I'm all about supporting them, but I'm also about making sure we understand we need those exports in order for us to do it. We need those exports. Uh, and some of the imports kind of bother me, but they, they are imports here because they're a lower, lower price and some of our lower customers can't afford our, our, our USB. We have a standard. And also, unfortunately, there's certain communities that can't afford the standard of US beef that we have, but we have to still feed America. So I'm one of those that want to be honest with my community. I don't want to sugarcoat it. I don't want to, but I'll need to be honest on a point that we meet their level so they understand it and that we, that, that they, we understand why we're going to the market venue that we're going to. So um, again, I am really good about having a vision. Every time I start something, what is my vision? What, is, what do I want to accomplish? Planning, how am I going to get there through the planning and implementation? How am I going to get there and who is going to support me beyond the community? Who's going to support me in, as in the corporate and education side and then evaluating each stage of, 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 the, um, of the planning and the implementation side? So that's about me. I hope there's um, some questions now. Oh my goodness, you have me taking notes like crazy. <laughs> Thank you so much. I um you know, uh Kimberly, two things that that stuck out to me that I want to uh to uh just touch upon is number one, I, I think I can speak for everybody on this uh conference and probably just about everybody in the country when I say that we when we see a lot of success, it comes from very passionate people. And your passion is is very empowering, uh, and I, I'm I'm so thankful that not only did you find it, but that you were working to instill that same passion into the next generation. I, I think that's amazing, and thank you so so much for sharing. I I took more notes than I usually do. So, um, but before we move on, I do want to uh, ask you a follow up question um, that I think is is important. We see it. <clears throat> and cat natra a, a lot of uh, a lot of farmers every day and i'm curious how do you manage to maintain uh, momentum uh with your peer to peer networks given the the fact that farmers and ranchers are are so busy all of the time how how do you how do you keep them engaged and i guess it's because they know my passion number one everyone that walks on this walks in my room i will help them i was i was just in i literally just flew back from washington dc yesterday and I was gone. And my dad's like, you have two producers here at the house. I said, what do they need help with? So I, with the, with the um, CAF program, I, I partnered with Merck and I keep a lot of the Merck medicine at my house. And they're like, we're about to vaccinate our calves and we need the medicine. I'm like, dad, just give them the vaccines they need. And when I get back, I'll talk to them on how the kind of correct way of vaccinating them. It's pretty much, I, I don't, I, I open my door at all times. It could be my ranch. It could be anywhere I am. I'm going to answer your phone call. And I will email and text and constantly communicate with them on market values, on what's going on. And I think with me able to communicate that, and also I have to be honest with my background, I did public relations for a while. And when you've been in that era for a while, you have really good communication skills. <laughs> and I think for me is listening. I will listen to you before I comment. And I think that's all we want as producers. A lot of times people want to comment before. I want to hear your whole story. I want to understand it. And I'm going to repeat it afterwards to show you that I listened. That's sometimes all a producer wants, not an answer. They just want you to listen to and be like, I hear you. 
you know, the calves are just not gaining weight in this. And um, like right now, someone's like, I'm still eating, I'm still having grass hay and I can't find hay. And I was able to get them hay from Louisiana and, you know, help them kind of, so I try my best to help and listen. Um, so I think that's the key. I think a lot of times we want to speak and also we want to judge. And um, I take the judgment out because um, I'm not in their shoes. So um, taking the judgment out, even if you disagree. So, so <laughs> great. Thank you. Uh, one last question. When do you sleep, Kimberly? Um, uh <laughs> I know, right? I am. I'm, I told my dad I'm home six days the next month, which is a blessing. Because, um, but I do work a lot on the road. I, I'm not married. I don't have kids. So let's just throw that in there. And um, that's probably why I'm not. <laughs> because my passion mm -hmm. is my husband and my kids are all my producers. <laughs> well, we, we are so thankful for your passion and your commitment to, to changing the way farmers farm and access markets. And I'm sure we're going to have lots of questions during the Q&A. Um, but for the sake of uh, staying mostly on time, which I'm not known for, I'm going to try to shift us into our next producer. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, Toby Bostwick. Uh, Toby has farmed in eastern New Mexico for 25 years. And over that time of conventional farming, he noticed the continual degradation of the topsoil that was interrupt and, and in turn interrupting his water cycle. And that sort of led to a shift in mindset to how he farms. Uh, Toby is committed to working with creation rather than against it. And in 2021, Toby and his wife, Kimberly, were awarded a New Mexico Department of Agriculture Healthy Soil Program grant to assist in implementing their soil health goals. Uh, Toby looks forward to sharing his challenges and successes in planting cover crops, bale grazing and high density rotational grazing to regenerate the land and feed communities. Toby, thank you so much and welcome to Growing Hope. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the sponsors. Thank you. You know, uh, this is going to be a little different. I don't quite have four points, but I, uh, I've got a little knowledge in farming over here in eastern New Mexico and regenerative farming. So I'll, I'll just tell you my story about Two years ago, I started, I've been an industrial farmer, commodities, uh, uh, typical f operation, industrial commodities for a long time. And over COVID, when COVID hit, I, I was walking in Walmart and I realized, hey, wait a minute, um, the shelves are getting kind of empty and I'm a farmer and I'm in Walmart waiting on something to eat. And so... <laughs> I, I started changing my game plan a little bit. And I think, I think, and first of all, I got to thank my wife. She is the biologist behind all this and the inspiration behind it all. And she, well, absolutely. She's the one that does cartwheels when we see dung beetles out in the past year. So I do have a team, a very supportive team. And, and uh, anyway, to get, to get my message across, I wanted more of, food sovereignty and I came to this decision by a little bit more of healthcare. I had some issues within the family uh, during COVID and during a lot of things that just I wanted to see a food sovereignty and taking care I mean it was time I kind of woke up just a little bit and, and maybe it's more of a going from a like you say a competitive nature and to to a contribution to to adding to what other people can do adding to what you can do so i started relooking my farm just completely um what you know in kimberly's presentation she was trying to get to where she can market things i've been on the marketing end a lot of times so i decided to do something different and go into more of a what can i do different how can i market it different I'm talking about changing the whole process. Like I want to make my farm and we have a slang, saying here, we're going to go from pasture to table because we did, we take, we took out all the antibiotics. We took out all the vaccinations. We've been raising cattle for a long time. And then we started direct marketing sheep, cattle and most of all our most fun success has been with chickens with 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 eggs pasture raised eggs out here 
and and going to a farmer's market last year and actually raising the products that are that are feeding people in our local community like from pasture to table obviously so we we do sheep we do some right now we don't have very many cattle we're doing cattle for ourselves right now we're, we're doing a lot of sheep and then chickens and so we plan on doing a lot of organic raised chickens this year but it comes from just really just thinking outside the box like looking around your community and and i'll be honest with you uh, what are you missing what 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 do people need um and where does it go and and i think that's where we came up with this idea and the main part was the climate change and, and i want to get to this we in my lifetime i've had basically one rain up till two years ago that was over five inches in the last two years we've had four and and three of those came in one year so not only is our moisture coming in less amount of time like we have to capture moisture on our farm protect it to be able to grow a crop because uh, the practices and some of the things we've been doing in the past is is in my opinion not it, it, we, we can do things better and and there's basically five principles that we can do better to talk about soil but i think we're further along with this and this is more about community and 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 building so i hope i'm on the right page with this as as i go forward but just to give you a little idea of where i've came from is we completely just went from you know the commodity's not right let's use the whole plant let's let's take let's take the diesel away let's take the cattle to the acres so we have literally um i took um alejandro's course uh down in mexico he is a wonderful wonderful holistic grazer and so started putting that together with what he's doing down there and what basically gabe brown's doing up in north dakota and i'm on the basically same line as them on east and west and so realized what we could do here on our farm and anyway long story short reading educating my wife is a, a very educated person and <laughs> so we we have learned and been on more of a research watching documentaries how to do these things um just a consistent educational process and we have to now and and I, I feel like there's some sort of urgency to do this now because i'm not you know the shape we're in and our farmer shape we're in and and basically the the economy that we're in yes prices are great right now for agricultural people but i've been in this for 25 years and they don't last long trust me so we need to be more sustainable we need to be more direct to the community more local in my opinion and so that's where i come use less resources for climate change and i also feel like in the past and what we're doing here with this grazing the soil scientists this education process is coming out our, we can literally change our weather pattern and we start to learn that maybe our nutrients in our soil and maybe our there's a whole different we we need to look at farming maybe in a different way and and that's where i guess i've had the luxury to do that uh being an industrial farmer for 25 years i, I i'm really looking forward to this next step of learning uh you know you just get back in the game and it's not about the bottom line so much anymore is it's about i've changed our farm into how many people can we feed so like <laughs> i've got these ratios on regenerative farm uh just on, on regenerative farm on how many people we can feed by doing this condensed grazing and and the numbers are astronomical um i do believe that <laughs> we can feed everybody very easy um you know if if we go back to local markets and uh yeah open our minds a little bit and use the whole plant rather than just the just the grain 
um, yeah, I, I, uh, there, there's ways that are different that are very, very good. And uh, yeah, so that's my story. Um, I'm really better at, a at answering questions. Um, I think I've covered sort of my basis and I hope y'all understand where I'm coming from. Um, that's, that's, that's my expertise and uh, I, I'll just hand it back over to you. Um, try to keep this short and try to keep, keep you back on time. But uh, yes, I, I'm really looking forward to questions. I really look forward to helping people nowadays. I, I don't have a lot of, but I am on the ground. I do, I do watch the green grass come back after a, a massive grazing event. I do see the dung beetles coming back in the ground and I do see the biology and the life coming back in the ground. And uh, that's sort of what we're missing. And that's, uh, that to me is very, very important for the future of farming. And I, you know, with our pollinators and, and certain things. So with that said, I'll just turn it back and uh, happy to answer any questions, go forth. Uh, yeah. the this sort of local marketing is becoming and the quality of food is, is for the consumer is becoming very important. We have found that it's not very hard to uh, get your customers to, 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 to get people who believe in the same things you do. You just have to get yourself out there and uh, just do it. It's going to take it. And it's, it's, it's time for uh, action at this point. And uh, yeah, thank you for your time. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Toby. It's, it's always great to hear um, from producers that are embracing the change. And I do. I'm glad you brought up this idea of feed the world. One of our coworkers here at uh, ATRA had written a great uh, <clears throat> blog post about uh, about that feed the world narrative that we need those big industrial system so hopefully somebody can drop that in the chat for us if if they haven't already um one of the questions that uh came in here while you were talking uh toby is producers in the midwest um that are attending farmers markets find them really strenuous on farmers and that it's not always worth it because of the amount uh, because of the little interaction and potential customer retention do you uh and the question is do you have any experience with that as a market vendor or absolutely so raise something different raise something that your competitor can't raise be proud of your location be proud of the way you raise it and then be transparent have people come to your farm have people see the food see the chickens that are laying the eggs have people come visit it um Absolutely. Once, once the transparency is there for the customers and you are given that next step of, yeah, that, that, that seems to be, that, that would be my clue for people. Yeah. So people want that in my opinion. Yep. Work on those relationships and get them to the farm. I think that that works for a lot of farmers. Uh, one, one other quick question because you did so well getting us back on schedule. Um, and this came in, in the chat. Um, what grains do you um do you plant um, for your stock and then what do you do with your stubble so yes in the past in the past and and you're gonna think i'm crazy but uh in the past i planted grain sorghum uh wheat and also raised a lot of corn uh in the past you would go out there and cut this and uh take it to town hopefully put some cows in and come back through so now today basically what i'm doing is condensing acres roping these off planting cover crops and basically grazing down the whole plant using the grain because the grain is honestly just going to be shipped and fed to the animal anyway so use the grain in the field pipe it up and then and then take your product to town with more weight with more sustainability with more of a product basically that's great thank you so much for sharing toby we have a lot of questions coming in so during the you you'll probably you'll probably be getting a lot more <laughs> but um I, I appreciate you so much it's always great to to hear how farmers are adapting and 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 again i think this this goes back to that idea of of adaptability and being willing to 
to step outside the box and really look at things. So thank you so much for sharing. And I'm going to move us right along and introduce yeah. our next panelist. Um, and in, in full disclosure, our next panelist is actually part of my direct community. Um, so uh, I, I feel like I have multiple communities. I have my local community, but then secondarily, I have my my larger national community, which you are all now part of. But um, so I'd like to introduce Sarah Day Evans. Um, Sarah Day founded Accelerating Appalachia um, to marry her years of work in sustainable economies, environmental protection, and social justice into a program to accelerate a regenerative, socially just economy. For the past 17 years, Sarah Day has worked at uh, for 17 years, Sarah Day worked at the Kentucky Department of Environmental Protection and North Carolina's Department of Commerce, where she built programs to promote healthier people and places. She has received U.S. presidential accommodations and state and regional awards for her work. And when Sarah Day's Sustainable Economy Program for high unemployment counties in North Carolina lost its funding, she launched a uh, the planet's first nature-based regenerative business incubator, Accelerating Appalachia, to continue on that important work of restoring the people and the place of one of the most biologically diverse yet poverty-stricken and over-extracted regions in North America, which is Appalachia. Sarah Day, welcome, and thank you for taking the time to join us. Thanks, Mike. It's great to be here. And I apologize. I should have sent you. I didn't send you a bio, so you obviously found that uh, a very lengthy one. I, I could have sent you something shorter. But that said, uh, it's great to be here, and um, um, I'm excited to actually be working with NCAT on a new project. I'll get into that a little bit. Um, and I do have, even though I said I don't, I'm not. I didn't have a slideshow. I think I'm going to try to screen share. Um, if I can, um, because I do have a little, I just thought it'd be nice to see some of the work. If again, if this will let me do that, I'm not, oh, there we go, share screen. Let's see how this goes that we don't need that. Um, I need this. Give me a second here. Uh, come on. Well, and I have an old laptop. So if it starts to freeze up, um, you'll have to look at me for for the rest of the show. Um, all right, we're getting there. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and put that in slide. Let's see if it goes, here we go. All righty. Um, so yeah, Mike kind of shared the tale of how I got here. Um, and uh, at 20, 2013, uh, we launched this program after losing the funding for the sustainable economies program that I was working so hard to advance in Western North Carolina. Um, and this was born out of that combination of, well, but our, my community is central and Southern Appalachia. Now that's a big region, but I've, I've lived all over the region and I'm a sixth generation Kentuckian, um, but spent a fair amount of time in Southwest Virginia and Western North Carolina, the, that central and Southern Appalachian region. And um, I've also been fortunate to live, my, my dad's family were farmers, I'm not a farmer, um, but to spend a, a fair amount of time on uh, incredible land and uh, central Kentucky has some of the best soils around. Um, and so, it got in, you know, it got into me early, um, and that the importance of our land, um, and so that's always been, you know, a guiding factor as well as water. I'm a hydrogeologist um, by training, uh, so accelerating Appalachia uh, came out, and we didn't, we weren't looking to be the world's first of anything. We were looking to, you know, solve for better land use um, and a more regional economy. Um, the global economy is fine, but we we knew that, you know, we had to re uh, instill more regional production. And the production that uh, we chose to focus on was food, clothing, and shelter, some of our basic needs type businesses. And how could those businesses support food, fiber and forest farmers. 
Uh, we live in one of the most biologically diverse regions in the world, yet, as Mike said, terribly overextracted. So this this was the goal um, and a big one, and um, it's been uh, quite a haul getting here so far, <laughs> ten years down the road. Because at the time, regenerative wasn't a thing like it is now, um, but good land use has been a thing for a long time. It's just you know it's got this new name, as many of us know. So we we uh, focused on this. Uh, business accelerator to help those businesses that were sourcing from food, fiber, and forest farmers um, in the production of, of our food and in our fiber and in our, uh, our shelter. And some of our businesses were uh, farmers with value-added products. Uh, some of our businesses have been businesses sourcing from 50 small growers in the region. And my approach has always been resiliency and we gain resiliency through diversity um, in our communities, through diversity in our consumption of goods. Um, when you have too much dependency on uh, a few huge uh, global corporations and huge agriculture businesses, you're subject to, um, to blight if something uh, like a pandemic comes along. A as we noticed, we <laughs> that, that really has messed with the supply chain. So, um, but we've used the pr principles of holistic management, values-based metrics and supply chains, uh, designs, uh, as well as social justice. And over 10 years, we have regenerated uh, generated, uh, accelerated uh, uh, over a hundred businesses, uh, helping to support thousands of farmers, and um, not ever knowing this how long this was going to last. Were we going to be able to really have an impact? And we feel that that has recently been validated by a 2022, uh, but the award is not kicking in until this year. A 20 million dollar climate smart grant which will allow us to shift this direct funding to incentives for farmers. And we're working with NCAT, KSU, Working Trees, Carbon Harvest, and more folks. So we're pretty excited about that. This is just some of the folks that inspired me, people I gr grew up with and had a, a real, whoops, I don't want that. What's that? Here we go. Um, sorry about this. <laughs> Getting back there. Uh, this is my dear friend, Bell Hooks, who passed on uh, not long ago, uh, uh, an amazing writer, uh, social justice leader. Um, and um, there's a real common thread between her and another important person in my life, which is Wendell Berry. And Bell would always say, ecological justice cannot exist without social justice and social justice cannot exist without ecological justice. Very similar to Wendell. Uh, you cannot save the land apart from the people or the people apart from the land. Um, and both Kentuckians, Wendell and Bell. And um, actually, Wendell's come out with a recent book trying to address his own experience, uh, it, you know, as a, a, a man of me, a, a man of means growing up in Kentucky, as opposed to what Bell experienced. But those are the two folks that have inspired me the most in this work. Uh, we call it Building Soil, Building Equity is our new program inspired by the, those folks. This is just a photo of Kentucky. <laughs> um, we've lost more mountaintops than any other state in the nation due to st uh, strip mining. Uh, we are also a biodiversity, whoops, hotspot, this little red area right here, that's us. And we are also one of the most impoverished regions in the US. And the, I won't go into a lot to the business accelerator um, because what we're doing moving forward in 2023 is a bit different, but this is how it's structured. People come in, they go through a program together over 12 weeks. We uh, have a, a really cool regenerative economy curriculum and amazing educators, about 30 or 40 folks that come in with their expertise in finance, marketing, um, legal, experts, investors, 
And um, if you're familiar with the business accelerator model, you're, they're often pitching to raise funds. We weren't as focused on that um, because venture capital funding can be problematic, but we worked very hard to, to push our network of funders to do better and not be as extractive with their funding. And, you know, working for 0% loans um, and, um, you know, zero equity, just, uh, doing what's good and needed for your community. Um, so that that's that's our model. Again, just examples of some of the types of businesses that we've worked with. Um, and these are some of our many, many mentors and leaders um, that have helped to move this, this uh, project forward. Uh, some of our businesses, um, Bakwa is a, a, a health beverage um, with multiple uh, organic grains grown in our region. We're very focused on ensuring that those companies that we work with are sourcing from our region. Uh, Carolina ground flour is the only um, organic flour uh, company in the Southeast that it sources entirely from the Southeast. Uh, that may have changed recently. Um, Riverbend Malt House, we worked with them. Uh, they, they make malt for craft brewing and distilling. Um, and sourcing from about 20 wheat, barley, and uh, rye farmers in Kentucky, North Carolina, and South Carolina. Uh, so these are some of the companies, and they have, you know, we, we bring them in if they have similar values to ours, oh, just partners, et cetera. And a cute little, a cute little, uh, Thinking outside the, the jar, <laughs> people, profit, and planet is our motto. Um, over the years, our graduates have, left, have leveraged over 20 million in investment, um, over 2,000 jobs, and at least 500 family farms, it's probably closer to 1,000 that are you know, among that sourcing network. And we get a lot of applicants from across the globe. We don't know why, um, because they'd have to travel here, any, anyway, we're working with farmers and businesses in the Appal in Appalachia and the southeastern region. And that's Natural Bridge here in my home state of Kentucky. So um, that said, I'm gonna stop this uh, stop share. What's happening now though, is we uh, just got this uh, big award. We were notified in September and uh, we're working with Mike and his team at NCAT as well as uh, Kentucky State University. They're gonna be our soil testing lab. And our goal is to work with around 600 uh, farmers in uh, Appalachia Central. I wanna be clear, the Central Appalachia down into Southern Appalachia. So that is basically Southern Ohio down to Georgia and the states in between that. Now, we'll be focusing on uh, mountain farmers, a lot of silvopasture, but we also are gonna be working with row crop and specialty crops, because we're gonna work across the states outside the Appalachian region. And that's always been our model. Um, we are, uh, we're focused on Appalachia and the rural Southeast, because we feel it's important to bridge those areas. Um, we need one another. And, and that's, that's our community is, um, bringing it together the businesses that might be in a more urban area with the growers in the rural areas. So we are still waiting on the final approval uh, for our, our design. And we, we got through the last hurdle. We think we still need to get the contract signed with the USDA and we're counting on that in the next few weeks. We understand it's been a slow process for them. They were handed a $2.8 billion pot of money and they had to design a whole program <laughs> and I know that's not been an easy task for them I'm, I'm sure they're probably understaffed as well so we're pretty excited about this beyond my wildest dreams um, most of the money's going to go to the farmers we're not being greedy um, I think we're you know we still work with a, a, a reasonable and modest budget on our end and um, Mike and his team are especially going to be doing the farmer training. Um, and we'll have a whole series of you know, announcements when we get the final final 
and can actually, you know, put out there, here's what we're looking for, here's how to apply, et cetera, et cetera. So pretty excited. And um, I know we're, you know, short for time. All right. Thank you so much, Sarah Day. Um, I did have a, a one question that came in, but I, I would li I'd like to back up just for a minute because we've we've highlighted a, a, a lot today in the the needs of adaptability, and um, because I, I I know you personally, I guess maybe I can lead this question, and I'm curious. I, I know that. Uh, the impact that COVID had on your your program, and then what steps did you take to adapt to that so that you could still, uh, you know, serve this vital role that you fill in in local uh, agriculture. Uh, I was going to say food system, but food, mm -hmm. fiber, and shelter uh, supply chain systems. Yeah. Uh, well, COVID had a pretty devastating impact on us. Um, because our per I, I love in person, <laughs> um, and our um, our businesses and farmers appreciated it as well. We were we were virtual, but we also um, the meat the, the the really the meat of our program was in person training, where we um, would work with. 10 to 15 businesses over a 12 week period. We travel together. We introduced them to markets across this region. Again, ours is a regionally resilient design. <clears throat> and so we travel, we host sessions in Kentucky and North Carolina and West Virginia and you know other states in order to build those networks and, and pair those folks with one another because that peer support was critical. Uh, so obviously traveling in vehicles together, in rooms together, just wasn't going to work. And um, the last, you know, the, the two years uh, prior to this were just really rough. Um, I had to just, I just transitioned to uh, online counseling, training, um, and yet there was some counseling. Somebody said in there, you kind of have to be a therapist too. <laughs> uh, you kind of do. Um but I was really, really, it was really hard. I don't know what else to say. I was pretty uh, concerned and were we going to, you know, go forward. And uh, those of you who've started businesses, you know how hard it is to build something from the ground up. And uh, when this, we, I saw this, this grant and I was like, well, damn, that, that's what, that's what we do. Um, you know, they're looking at, you know, climate smart commodities, what it, call it what you will, climate smart, re regenerative, good land use. Um, that has been a core focus for us. And um, we we went for it and we got it. So <laughs> we, uh, we live to tell the story and move forward. It's a five-year program and it just feels great. I don't know what else to say. That's great. Thank you so much, Sarah, Day, for joining us. I, I believe we're moving into, if I can find my agenda, we're moving into the Q&A session for, for audience questions. Um, and I have a few, and because my notes are right here, Sarah Day, I'm going to ask you the first question that came up for you. Um, is uh are you all uh working with invest appalachia for social impact building i'm very familiar with them and we what we do is we have a whole network of folks that you know we communicate with or we just at least are like hey when when we've got a business or a farmer that's looking for a loan or an investor um somebody that you know when I say investor, that's typically an equity or quasi equity investor, so somebody that wants to take on a partner that can invest not only in the business with their money, but also their time and expertise. Um, I certainly know them. I know their work. Um, and we uh, it, again, it's so they're one of many folks in our network. And I say our network. Um, we don't, this is just all the different lenders we've identified that have similar values. Um, and when we've got a company looking for an investor, we'll look out to all those different lenders, food, food capital um, out in Charlotte, Charlottesville is another really good um, investor in that space. Um, so 
we just reach out to that network when it when we are looking for a fit. You know, what is what kind of investor would this uh, business want to engage with? Because we are very particular. I will tell you that we are very particular. Uh, you know, a lot of, in, you know, investment is largely designed around the profits for investors historically. And we, we're designed around how can we sustain this business and um, find folks that value that. Thank you so much. Um, so I have a, a, a question for Kimberly. Um, Kimberly, where do you see food cooperatives within your network building uh, resiliency and diversifying income sources? Yeah, that's a great question because I think that was that's the basis of us starting these um, centralized um, meat hubs really for producers. Um, our goal is ultimately to be independent and have our own cooperative. That is our goal, but we have to create a system um, that could be successful, and that's what we are. And I do see, um, when I was talking to Cargill about the, the process that we're going into, um, our goal is to hopefully create a system that can be plopped in any state um, and not to be dependent on Cargill. Hopefully, we could take Cargill out the picture but right now we need them because we do not have a system in place. We're right now at stage one or we're just weaning calves for 90 days and sending them directly to the feed yard. Hopefully we can own each state of, stage of that system sooner or later, but um, it's just going to take time and time is going to take a couple of years. So we have to be realistic. This timing is not just overnight. It might take 10 to 15 years for us to do this. So um, originally our partnership, just like any other investors, how long are you gonna be in this with us to let us go through some of these ups and downs? Cause as everyone knows, climate is part of these, this system. Um, the financial interest rate is part of this system. Everything is part of the system. So um, you, as the system goes up and down, we need those investors to go up and down with us to realize that um, in order to be successful, it's a long, long-term partnership. So long-term partnership, hopefully will be a food hub that will um, be successful. We are talking to other similar, there are some similar organizations in other states. They might not be run exactly like we're run. So we are in constant communication with um, another organization called AgriUnity in, in, Cal I mean, in Atlanta. There's some another one in South Carolina. So we are keeping them in the loop of what we're doing. So hopefully um, once we get a system together, we can kind of plop it in some of those regional systems in other, in other states. Great, thank you. And then one, one other follow-up while I, while I have you right there talking, Kimberly, uh, the question is, is uh, your 100 ranchers group a 501c3 NGO or a looser group? What type of business structure do you so have? So we are, we are 501c3 on the education side. Um, we're 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 gonna we're in the process of creating an LLC for the actual cattle side, just because really the five hundred one c main purpose is just for education. Um, we don't want to combine those two. That's when you kind of get in trouble. Um, so so we're separating that entity from the five hundred one c three. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Taya, what types of um, farming are you open to? for uh, beginning farmers that you're leasing to? Is there a specific production or is there capacity for whatever the farmer is interested in? I mean, my personal passion is the regenerative organic. Um, so that's the area that I tend to go towards. I mean, I respect everybody's choice and how they choose to farm, um, but that would be the preference and where I would take them because it's, it's back down to our natural resources. And I think it's a good way to protect our number one asset, which is the land. Thank you so much. And then uh, a quick, uh, another follow-up to that. Um, you know, you're, you're farming in uh, Southeast Nebraska. And as, as I can imagine, there aren't a, a, <laughs> an abundance of markets there. So um, where are the markets for your, for your products? Um, sure. I'm just going to head you a little bit farther northeast to Nebraska. Um, so that would be my neck of the woods. Um, markets are, I mean, nationwide and global, if you think about it. Um, it just depends on, like anybody else, so many factors. What's the price? What's the demand? Um, how much is it going to cost me to move it? Um, I, too, would love to see things more uh, regionalized, uh, more hubbed. 
I think, you know, that feed the world comment we had before is I know we have capacity to take care of our people. It's just um, right now the system, if you will, is not set up that way. Um, so I commend every one of you for taking the steps and actions to bring that more uh, local. So as far as markets for me, I've got people within 30 miles. Um, I try to work with other growers, other like livestock producers who are trying to convert their business over to like more regenerative or regenerative plus organic. Thank you so much. Uh, Toby, got a tough one for you. So I uh, hope you've got your notes out. Uh, do you do field days? And are you part of the Regenerative Soils Group in New Mexico? Someone on this call would love to see your farm. I'm sure everyone would love to see your farm, but one specific person put that in a chat. <laughs> well, y yes, yes, I do do field days. And and my farm, uh, you know, I see all these beautiful mountaintop farms on, you know, on these presentations. And we literally are like in the desert. So uh, <laughs> I just want people to know I'm in New Mexico. So uh yeah, it's it's very dry, um, but absolutely we do. Yeah, any any sort of tours, we we I hope to get a hold and be a part of New Mexico Farm to Table group. Uh, we joined um, a little group. I forget what it was, but we we Johnson Sioux processor. We we do have. We're starting to make connections in New Mexico. Put it that way, and and. Healthy Souls Grant has been a very big part of that, and uh, there there is. Uh, a lot of funds, I, I may just add, you know, through different venues, more than USDA or, or other venues that, that may be possible to help people in these other, other industries also. So, yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much. And, um, uh, <clears throat> Sarah Day, I feel like you kind of alluded to this earlier, but I, I think maybe I'll ask each of the, the the panelists to answer each of you to answer this for me or give you a minute to answer it but i'll start with you sarah day um do you have any thoughts on how um how we can avoid this um well i'm trying to dance around it how can we avoid corporate greenwashing and make sure that the programs that actually j create benefit for impacting climate change, you know, how do, how do we highlight those programs and avoid corporate greenwashing? And you all are very welcome for that clear and concise question. You're muted, Sarah. Day. Yeah, I know, I'm sorry. Um, well, that, that's important to us. And we worked with some big corporations um, that have, you know, the kind of values that that mirror ours but that we uh know that they hold true to those values um anytime you got a big corporation serving tens of thousands and millions of people um it's going to be imperfect i mean it's it's you know it gets harder and harder to hold hold those standards and i don't want to hark back to what kimberly said about working with cargill because uh they reached out to us as well kimberly by the way and um the guy is in Knoxville and we're definitely going to have that conversation. And so I think, you know, as a smaller organization, you know, we just, we just hold a real high standard and we do our best to make sure that the folks we will, we work with are committed to that as well. Um, but, uh, you know, there are certifications like Thea organic re regenerative organic, um, which, you know, they've got pretty stringent, um requirements for that and that's where i'm like well okay big corporation can you like move towards the regenerative organic certification i mean i think it's just a process of moving that you know moving those folks forward because i know you know i know folks in big corporations and they and they have really good intentions it's just a lot more challenging and in some ways you know maybe easier when you have that kind of funding um but that said that's how we go about it with we worked with patagonia a lot and lush cosmetics who we brought into appalachia because they'd never been sourcing in the northeast or anywhere in in north america and so got them introduced to botanical growers in the appalachian region which of course that's a, an abundant um diverse sector for this region 
they they always sourced from uh, a broad diversity of small farmers rather than a couple of large farms. For instance, they could grow all of their lavender on 10,000 20 acre farms. They've always chosen to source from a wider range of small farmers. And that's more resilient because you're going to lose some businesses, but you got some left. You're going to lose some farmers, but you got some left. If you're relying on one or two big farms, you're just more vulnerable. So, Thank you. And Kimberly, you next. I'll just re restate the question for, for myself. Um, do you have any thoughts on how we can avoid corporate greenwashing and making sure that the programs we're implementing are actually doing what they say they do? Right, right. So it, it's important that we have... Um, definitely hold them accountable but i think it's being up front at the very beginning this is my organization and you're working for me personally you're working <laughs> with a demographic that is probably a different demographic that you ever worked with and um the barriers are probably barriers you've never seen when you came down and look at a tour from from some of the demographics you, you have everyone from a to z so you have to be patient and this is how we want to use our funding so for us, it was just a blunt conversation. And again, I understand there's corporate out there and I, and I am in agreement on, I must, I have my own meat company. I, I have all that too. And I'm very local and I believe in local, but not all producers can be local. Not all producers can produce their own feed. There has to be an outlet for all of our producers. I'm blessed enough to have the land, have the resources to do it. So what about all those other producers that can't? We have to find a system for them to stay in, in, in the system also. And, and it's gonna take corporate sponsorship for them, but we have to hold that corporation accountable. Um, I, I originally started speaking when I, and I'm going back to cargo because cargo gets beat up all the time. Um, there's several situations. I originally, when I originally started talking to them, I said, this is what I wanted. And they let us create this black equity initiative plan. We sat on a call every week for three hours to say, this is our barriers and this is what we want you to accomplish. And when they put in a press release, I hold them accountable and everything they put on a press release. So the key thing is, is for us to make sure that they put it in paper and that we hold them accountable. That's all we can do. And then yes, they, they got money off of us to begin with. We might as well use that money for the benefit of our or organization so the key is to know they exist no they're probably not going anywhere but holding them accountable for whatever your your um, organization is is actually um, mission statement is hold them accountable for that and let them know and then um, make sure you're successful just like them on on the level that you can be successful at thank you so much uh, Toby any thoughts on that Yeah, I really appreciated Kimberly's answer, um, holding them accountable. Um, yeah, I, I, I see, yeah, maybe a new way, uh, a new system, uh, maybe possibly even ideas are being so, things are happening so much quicker today. So Facebook, information, everything, you can research so quickly. So I, I honestly see farmsteads homesteads out here we got plenty of land out here but i mean when your homestead or your house could actually provide food sovereignty uh solar systems and energy prices and everything together it, it drives people back out to the rural areas especially when they can work from home and and do this on the internet so i really see like a revamping maybe a, and more energy coming back to agriculture I, I i do and and corporations uh need to be to me uh yeah capitalism only works when there's competitive capitalism and so uh we make each other better so that's where i stand on a lot of these so yep thank you very much tell you anything you'd like to add yeah, I'm just, I love the answers. So well done panelists, that's exciting. Um, you're right, uh, the certifications are a standardized um, stamping mechanism, uh, but value alignment in anybody you work with, big or small, I think is imperative because if you don't have that, you're, you don't have the foundation of your relationship. Uh, the uh, third thing I'd talk, 
talk about is if I am working with a corporation, are they open to or willing to do, there's third-party verification tools that can be used to actually measure what they are potentially greenwashing with or talking about just to validate, you know, let's put some, you know, numbers behind and quantify some of the actions that they say they're actually taking. And I think, Toby, your point about social media, a lot of companies and a lot of brands are actually in the process of doing this just because the pressure of social media and the awareness that people have of what is actually happening, it's, it's hard to keep it quiet anymore. Great, thank you. We're we're getting very close to the the networking session, but I would like to to give each of you a, a chance um, to uh, give our participants uh, any advice you may have. All of you uh, clearly excel at building community and integrating community into your work. So, uh, just to give you all a quick uh, second to share any wisdom with our participants about. Um, ideas on how they can become active involved in building community in their areas and uh, I'll, I'll start with you Taya because you're off mute ah, um there's so many different ways I think the biggest thing is we have to get out of our comfort zone so we have to leave our place we have to leave our farm we have to leave our little network um, of people we do know and introduce yourself to somebody new so as uncomfortable it is how be comfortable being uncomfortable, I think would be the best advice I would give and get out there and talk to somebody new. Thank you so much. Kimberly. I'm in a total agreement. Be comfortably uncomfortable. Um, I will just do a personal plug for myself. Um, I, um, I have taken a leap of doing a lot of TV production lately. Um, I did a TV show on Hulu called BBQ Quest, which kind of talks about the farm to table um, mechanism that I have here. I just did a show on Magnolia Network called Family Dinner with Andrew Zimmer, if anyone's familiar with Andrew Zimmer. We had an opportunity to do a TV show at the ranch um, with me and his crew. Um, that is um, was actually premiered on Magnolia on February 17th, but you can still watch it on HBO Max or Paramount or Amazon Prime or one of those type of networks. Just type my last name in, Ratcliffe, and that show will come up. And it's really talking about um, using the resources off my ranch for the dinner table. So we use our pear tree to make my, instead of apple pie, pear pie, we use the meat. So it's really how do you use those resources and how my mom used those resources. My mom passed away in 2019 and how I continue that tradition to use the resources um, back to the family ranch. And I think that's key just for the, the entire community. And then I just did a docu-series for NCBA, National Cattlemen's Beef Association. Um, they followed me around for 15 days from ranch to table, talking about similar things I talked about here, how I created a community of cattle producers. And um, we're hoping it's not confirmed that those are going to go to um, quite a bit of film and wine festivals this summer. So it's so wide. And I and I did this and I, I didn't do it intentionally. I've been approached to do a lot of this media stuff. I'm also there's more to come. I, I can't announce some of the other things to come, but there's more media to come. But I think that's important. Social media being on TV. I, I'm, I'll be honest, being a black woman in this community to show my face that anyone can do it. That's another drive that I have. I have another drive to show it in many, as many media um, platforms I can show it on. Thank you, Toby. Yeah, sorry. You know, I great answer, Kimberly. It's hard to it's hard to follow Kimberly. We need a different order here. But anyway, <laughs> uh, yes, I the and I'll say this: the truth does never mind being questioned. So if, if somebody is telling you the truth, you question them. You I mean, People don't mind. Get out there. I, I think it takes a little energy. It takes a little ambition. And we, got, we all got it. So get out there. Be a part of the system. Let's, let's get to the bottom and just help our community, help our overall community, help, help the health of your community. And believe it or not, guys, it, it makes a big difference, the health of your community, by raising good food. It just does. It, 
it's it's amazing it's it's nuts thanks so much sarah day thoughts on building community um well i just um you know a couple of folks have talked about and i think toby especially you um on seeing this energy in agriculture and energy in community and and folks returning to rural areas which i think balances us in ways that you know uh that we need to be balanced um and i guess i, I i'm just i see it happening <laughs> I, I see community building not just around the work we've done but i feel like people are you know we've i think we kind of reached a breaking point in of of what's not working <laughs> and people are figuring out what's going to work for us and building community um around those solutions and I, i'm not a pollyanna it's a still a huge mess <laughs> in many ways but you know in the world you know uh, that that we're operating in we're just seeing more and more young folks coming into this world and as Thea said, that's highly encouraging. Thank you so much. This does mark the end of our formal programming here. We do have a, a networking session after this, but Kimberly, Taya, Toby, Sarah Day, uh, I'm I'm leaving here today uh, feeling a, a little bit smarter and feeling like I need to work a little bit harder myself. So I want to thank you all so much for sharing with us and and spending your time and, and sharing your inspiring stories with us. And uh, hopefully you all can stick around for a little bit for the networking session. Uh, it's been a complete honor to uh, to just be a fly on the wall with with you four. So thank you very much um this again i i want to mention that this year's conference has been made free for all of the attendees and that's been made possible by the generous support of our sponsors uh i do want to uh give a big shout out to uh my employer mcat and atra we heard today uh kimberly clearly articulated the importance of meeting farmers where they're at in the conversation and i think we excel at that um this is also has been brought to you by the usda rural development uh, Rural South Institute, Western SARE, the Hemp Industries Association, and Clearwater Credit Union. We could not have done any of this without all of those sponsors and all of our speakers' time. So I thank you all, and I believe I'm passing the torch. Is that correct? That's right. Thank you, Kimberly. These are my lovely coworkers. Miss Nina and Miss Elise. Thank you guys. While they're here, let's see if we can get them to blush. These are the two people that put this entire thing together and have held it up and have put up with all kinds of crazy questions and concerns from folks like me that had to jump in here and do this. So uh, a big round of air applause for these two as I hand it over. You both are wonderful and have done a tremendous job. Thank you so much for everything. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, panelists. I love that we brought this message home with a message of community, getting out there, being comfortable with being uncomfortable. I love that. Being curious, asking questions um, without judgment, listening. These are all great takeaways to wrap up what has been a conference on a, a challenging subject. Um, we've heard for the past, well, for the past three weeks, We've heard from an outstanding lineup of presenters, all the way from soil-centric climate beneficial practices to remarkable stories of resilience. We're in awe and we're so grateful to the producers who have shared with us over the past three weeks. We heard on Tuesday from Dr. Elizabeth Heilman about making a done list, which really landed with us. Instead of a to-do list, making a done list. So you can feel that sense of accomplishment and empowerment. So as we all prepare to step out with a giant gust of conference wind at our backs, please post in the chat something on your done list and something you're now inspired to do.
think you're, I think I'm handing it off to you, Mina. I just posted uh, something in, on my done list. I built a new compost pile <laughs> in my house. <laughs> It's a small celebration, but I think uh, I think there is power in uh, celebrating the little steps because they they do add up. And um, I just love to take the opportunity to share some thoughts that um, that I had um, after after experiencing this uh, three week conference. Um, so when working towards soil health, regenerative grazing, biological soil fertility, agroforestry, and community well-being, it's important to look where we're aiming in the long term, because these processes take time. Growing trees takes time. Learning new skills takes time. Accumulating soil carbon takes time building community relationships and trust takes time. But climate change is happening now. And so there's no better time to start on these long-term goals today. As Toby Bostwick said earlier, it is time for action. When so much of the economy we work within is so extractive and running at speeds that our minds can't even compute with fortunes rising and falling alongside a nonstop news cycle, it is challenging to, to think and operate with this longer term mindset. But uh, I recently learned a way to adjust our minds to start thinking longer term with a concept called the 200 year present. It's a thought experiment of sorts that I heard about on the radio show On Being with Krista Tippett, one of my favorites that I'm always telling my coworkers about. <laughs> so I'll walk you through this little exercise. Um, your 200 year present begins with the birth date of the oldest person you knew when you were a child. For me, that was my great grandmother, Florence Clark, who was born in 1896. And then on the other side of the 200 year present is the 100th birthday of the youngest person you have held in your arms. For me, it's been a couple of years since I got to hold a baby. So let's say that 100th birthday will be in 2120. That means that I have had physical contact and connection with people who lived or will potentially live between 1896 and 2120. I barely even know how to say 2120. Is it 2120? I don't know. <laughs> um, so actually for me, it's a little more than 200 years. Um, so I encourage each of you to do this little exercise. And that's the lifespan of people who have directly touched our lives. And in agricultural terms, uh, think of all the changes that have happened since 1896, and think of the changes that are to come in the next 100 years. We are all influenced by what came before us, and we are all empowered now to influence what happens in the next 100 years. Starting today, we can choose to start or continue the land healing process fixing mistakes that were made in the past and returning to agroecological practices that will make the second half of our 200 year present greener with carbon being drawn down, with cleaner water and air, with richer soil, with more trees, with increasing biodiversity and with healthier people and communities. So many of the speakers that we heard from over the past three weeks are already doing the work now to create this future. Dr. Rattan Lal started off this conference with a look at soil health, and he shared how soil health is necessary for planetary health. And he pointed out that achieving this is only possible with political stability and peace. Dr. Jeff Creek with Carbon Cycle Institute shared strategies. Oh, I'm freezing up.
Can you see my screen? No. I have completely frozen. Do you want to keep reading, Nina, and I'll move the slides? Sure. Well, we can hear you. We can't see the slides. But I'm happy to keep reading. <laughs> yeah, you can keep sheet? reading. I'm frozen. OK. <laughs> Were you at Dr. Jeff Creek? Is that mm -hmm. where you? OK. Yeah. Dr. Jeff Creek of the Carbon Cycle Institute shared strategies farmers can use to get a positive feedback loop cycling in a way that increases soil carbon for decades. Mr. Hewlin Johnston, a farmer yeah. from North Carolina, told the story of revitalizing degraded land that couldn't even grow weeds, making it productive soil once again. Molly Taylor of PT Ranch in California talked about how their fields were able to withstand weather extremes and how thrilled she was to see native pollinators returning to her fields. Lauren Poncia of Stemple Creek Ranch spoke of how Mother Nature is our dance partner, where sometimes we are in sync and other times it doesn't work out so well. Mark Schoenbeck with the Organic Farming Research Foundation dove into the science underpinning biological soil fertility, which I can't even begin to cover here except to quote one simple truth he said, living soil changes everything. Oklahoma farmer Emily Oakley and Montana rancher Dave Scott both shared how they are producing their own soil fertility on farm and rely on biologically based practices to ensure productivity and profitability. They are both succeeding in getting off the perpetual input method of farming. And their stories were inspiring and full of practical knowledge. One piece of advice that came out of that session was there are going to be problems as you transition off chemical fertilizers. Stick to the biological fixes to these problems. Don't backslide into the familiar short-term fixes. Keep moving forward. We learned about the power of agroforestry to mitigate climate change. Eric Tonsmeyer talked about many ways trees can provide long-term carbon sequestration and farmers on either side of the country, Ellie Honan from California and John Niger of Massachusetts shared how planting trees on their farms can bring communities together with community chestnut roasts and food forest festivals. Kate McFarland and Gary Bentrip shared resources the USDA has to offer to support farmers in their agroforestry endeavors. So many people are working to lift up agroforestry as a climate solution. It's really inspiring. We learned from Carl Tiedemann with Soil for Climate that in grasslands, grazing is not optional. We need animals to build up soils in grasslands. They are an integral part of that, that ecosystem. And he spoke of just how quickly soils can be built using the right kinds of managed grazing. Four graziers shared their wisdom with us as well, ground truthing Carl's presentation. They have built up healthy soils with measurable differences between their soils under carefully managed grazing and soils under continuous grazing nearby. Indiana shepherd Denise Rackley said how critical it was to have a soil up mindset and also imparted this wisdom, which I think is good in all walks of life, not just farming. Learn quickly, fail cheaply, maintain flexibility. Minnesota shepherd Janet McNally showed us how good grazing is good for the soil, climate, and awesome for human health. Montana rancher Megan Lannon emphasized the importance of having the mindset that you can change, you can succeed. If you think you can't, you won't. Montana rancher Malloy Lannon, our youngest presenter at age 16, spoke up for future generations, reminding us that we have to adapt so young farmers can have a chance at succeeding in the wonderful life that is farming.
All right. And finally, when we heard from Dr. Elizabeth Heilman, I think everyone listening was inspired and empowered to go out and start walking through doors to initiate change on their farms and in their communities. From Kendra Kimbaraskas, Jeremy Brown, and Lisa Schmidt all shared their stories of overcoming challenges as fast moving as a racing wildfire and as slow moving as prolonged drought. They offered heartfelt advice for farmers experiencing tough times. Listen to your intuition. Don't make decisions in the middle of a problem if you don't have to. Sit with it. Pray about it if you're a person of faith. Don't rush into major changes. Have a plan A and a plan B. Know your neighbors. And today we heard from producers weaving their communities together to build toward a future of interdependence and community support. Farmers and ranchers should never feel alone and isolated. We hope you leave this conference with tools to get you started moving forward into the next 100 years. We hope you leave with hope, a vision, a mission, and enough knowledge to be able to take the next step towards regeneration and resilience. Thank you for joining us over the past three weeks. It's been a true honor sharing this space with y'all, conversation, connection. All sessions will be on our ATRA YouTube page, so you can go back and revisit if you'd like to watch again, listen again, feel re-inspired. You can also share with your community, share with your friends and your neighbors. And you can always find more resources on atra.ncat.org. And don't forget to continue the conversation and stay engaged on our forum, which you can find at atra.ncat.org forward slash forum.